الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وقال تعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال تعالى أيضا والذين جاءوا من بعدهم يقولون ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم صدق الله العظيم All praise and thanks be to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is our creator, sustainer, nourisher, protector and curer. May the choicest of his blessings and salutations be upon our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family members, his companions and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyamah. My dear brothers in Islam, first and foremost I enjoin upon myself and then all of, all of you all who have come here this evening to adopt a life of taqwa. For it is only through a life of taqwa can a slave of Allah attain success in this world as well as the hereafter. May Allah the Almighty make us all from the people of taqwa. So this evening we are to discuss the life of an extremely great personality. But before we go into that, let's touch on why it is so important that we study the lives of the Prophets alayhim salatu was salam, the lives of the Sahaba ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhim ajma'een. What is the reason or why is it so important? My dear brothers in Islam, O sons of Islam, it is in the DNA of human beings to emulate, to put someone in forward as a role model and to follow someone. That is in our DNA. We always wish to follow someone. So it is a matter of whether we have good role models to follow or are we having bad role models that we follow. Because at the end of the day, we are going to be raised with those whom we follow. Look at the ayah where Allah the Almighty, He informs Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ هَدَى اللَّهُ فَبِهُدَاهُ مُقْتَدِنْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the Anbiya alayhimu salatu wa salam أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ هَدَى اللَّهُ They are those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided فَبِهُدَاهُ مُقْتَدِنْ So through their guidance, O Rasulullah, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you follow them, Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us in regard to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, There has certainly been for you all in the messenger of Allah an excellent role model. For anyone whose hope is in Allah the Almighty and the last day, the day of Qiyamah. And those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often. So my dear respected elders, brothers in Islam, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah he's highlighting the importance of us taking Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as our role model. But today sadly we live in a time where many of us we suffer complexes to look like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And on the other hand, we are having role models that lead us towards wise and sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now moving on to the Sahaba, Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi majma'een, let us briefly look at what the stance of the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah is in regard to the Sahaba, Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi majma'een. And for this, we will be touching from the famous book of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, Laqidatul Wasitiyya. This was a famous book which Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah wrote in response to a judge in Wasit who wanted him to write in regard to his, uh, in regard to the Aqeedah. So this book, he begins this book with the first chapter talking about Firqatun Najiya, the saved group or the saved sect. Who, who are the saved group? In other words, because there is a hadith of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stating that this ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will divide into 73 sects, 73 groups. And all of them will be in the fire of Jahannam except for one group and that is the saved group. So the Sahaba Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhi majma'een, they ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, as to who are they Ya Rasulullah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam clarifies that they are those who are upon that which me and my Sahaba Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhi majma'een are upon. Allahu Akbar. So going on to what Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah says in regard to the Sahaba, Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhi majma'een, he says, فَمِنْ أُصُولِ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ وَالْجَمَاعَةِ سَلَامَةُ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَأَلْسِنَتِهِمْ لِأَصْحَابِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. That it is from the fundamental principles of Islam that the people of the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah will have purity of heart and tongue towards the Sahaba Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi majma'een. In other words, basically, we will not have any ill feeling towards any of the Sahaba Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi majma'een, nor any anger, any hatred, nothing of these despised qualities towards the Sahaba Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi majma'een. And he goes on to say, just as Allah the Almighty has described them in the Noble Quran, the ayah I recited in the beginning, وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِن بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا فِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ Those who come after them, those who come after them, them in the sense the Sahaba Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi majma'een. And who have come after the Sahaba? It is us. We are the ones who have come after the Sahaba Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi majma'een. Allah the Almighty says, say in regard to them, Ya Allah, forgive us. Rabbana ghfir lana. Forgive us and forgive our brothers who preceded us in faith. Purify our hearts of any rancor, any hatred. Towards the, towards the believers, Ya Allah, you are the most gentle, the most compassionate. And then he goes on to say that it is upon us to obey the statement of our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And please remember salawat whenever I mention his name. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لا تسبوا أصحابي فوالذي نفسي بيده لو أنفق أحدكم مثل أحد ذهب ما بلغ مد أحدهم ولا نصيفة الله أكبر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم is reported to have said do not do not revile my companions do not scold my companions do not insult my companions by Allah in whose hand my soul is if any one of you all spends gold the equivalent of Mount Uhud the equivalent of Mount, uh, Mount Uhud, basically mountains in gold, even if you were to spend mountains in gold, it will not even equal a handful of any of them, nor even half of a handful. Allahu Akbar. This is the status of the Sahaba Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi majma'een. This hadith is in Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah. 
So from the Sahaba Ridwanullah Ta'ala alayhim ajma'in, my dear brothers in Islam, inshaAllah, today, this evening, we are indeed privileged. It is a blessing of Allah upon us that we will be discussing about a very, very great Sahabi radiallahu anhu from the Sahaba Ridwanullah Ta'ala alayhim ajma'in. A man who Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself titled him as Sayfullah al-Maslul. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam titled him as the drawn sword of Allah, as the unsheathed sword of Allah, Allahu Akbar. A man who Abu Bakr radiallahu an said in regard to him, عَجَزَتِ النِّسَاءُ أَنْ يَلِذْنَ مِثْلَهُ Women will no longer be able to give, the, give birth to the likes of him. In another narration, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is reported to have said in regard to this man, O oh Quraysh, Ya Quraysh, he is a lion who has attacked another lion and overpowered that lion. Allahu Akbar. And he goes on to say that women can no longer bear sons the likes of him. My dear brothers in Islam, he is a master of war. He is the friend of death. He has the dash of a lion and the patience of a cat. According to the statement of Amr ibn As radiallahu an, he is the commander about whom a Byzantine priest once warned his followers by saying, is the standard of this army a black one? Is the flag of this army a black one? Is the commander of this army a tall, powerfully built, broad-shouldered man with a large beard and a few pock marks on his face? Then beware of fighting this army. He was the commander who wrote a letter to a Persian emperor commanding him, submit to Islam and you will be safe. Or agree to the payment of jizya and you and your people will be under our protection. Or else you will have only yourself to blame for the consequences. For I bring men who desire death as ardently as your men desire life. Allahu Akbar. Apart from our great Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, history has not witnessed a greater military commander, a greater warrior, a greater soldier who did not bat even an eyelid in front of death. And he was none other than Abu Sulaiman, Khalid ibn al-Walid, ibn al-Mughira, al-Makhzumi, al-Qurashi, a.k.a. Sayfullah al-Maslul, the drawn sword of Allah. Allahu Akbar. Radiyallahu an. So my dear brothers in Islam, now we move on to the life of Khalid ibn al-Walid. Radiyallahu an. He was known as Abu Sulaiman. In other words, his kunya. Amongst the Arabs, we have something known as kunya. There is a name, there is a laqab, and there is a kunya. What are these three? The name is the general name given to a person. Laqab is basically translated as nickname. You have nicknames. Yeah? Like say for example, Aisha radiallahu anha, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to call her very fondly, Ya Humaira. Ya Humaira. That was not her name, rather a laqab, a nickname given to her, or a pet name if you will, by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which translates as, O oh, rosy cheeked one. Very fondly, out of love, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to call her Ya Humaira. Now what is Kunya? Kunya is generally to call a person the father of so and so. The father of so and so. So Khalid ibn al-Walid was known as Abu Sulaiman, in other words, the father of Sulaiman. But Kunya necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a son, if you say father of Sulaiman, that he has to have a son called Sulaiman. You can even call yourself, for example, Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira radiallahu an, now he did not have a son with the name Huraira. Rather, Huraira translates itself into a small kitten or a small cat. Because he was very fond of cats, and there was once an instance where he had very large sleeves, you could say, a cat fell asleep in one of his sleeves whilst he was having his hand like this perhaps. 
Now he was so kind and he was so merciful, he did not want to wake up the cat. He basically cut his sleeve not to disturb the nap of the cat. We call it a cat nap. The nap of the cat. Yeah? So from that day onwards he was known as Abu Huraira. So this is what Akunia means. So Khalid ibn al-Walid, his name was Khalid, he was the son of al-Walid, okay, and his kunya was Abu Sulaiman. So my dear brothers in Islam, the sons of Islam, soon after the birth of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, he was taken away from his mother, as this was the custom amongst the families of the Arabs, or of the Quraysh, and he was sent to a Bedouin tribe in the desert. A foster mother was appointed to look after him. And this, the Arabs had this practice because they wanted their sons to be brought up in the natural environment, environment of the desert where they grow up strong and away from the hustle and bustle of the city. This was the case even with our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was also looked after by Halima. He is uh, the, the, the witness that looked after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So a foster mother was found for Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, and she was appointed to nurse him and bring him up. He was brought up in the clear, unpolluted land, in other words, the desert of Mecca. He was brought up for, in the sense, he spent around three to four years in the desert. After, after around five, or perhaps when he had attained the age of five or six, he came back to Mecca. He, was, he, he returned to Mecca uh, under the guardianship of his parents. Now, sometime in his childhood, he had an attack of smallpox. Smallpox, which he, uh, I mean, he came out of completely, but it left behind a few pock marks on his face. And that is why we see the Byzantine priest describing him as a man with a few pock marks on his face. Now, in regard to his tribe, now I said that his name is Khalid ibn al-Walid al-Makhzumi. Now, he was from the tribe of Banu Makhzum. Now, before we go further, so, so as to there is not to be any confusion amongst the tribes, the Quraysh were one big huge tribe of the Arabs, the Quraysh. The Quraysh. Now, the Quraysh, amongst them, they had a few sub-tribes. The Quraysh break down into a few sub-tribes, mainly three sub-tribes known as Banu Hashim, Banu Abd dar from which an offshoot of that tribe is Banu Umayyah, but let's not go into that. You remember Banu Hashim, Banu Abd dar and Banu Makhzum. Banu Hashim, Banu Abd dar and Banu Makhzum. Now Banu Hashim was the tribe of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Banu Makhzum was the tribe uh, from which uh, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu was from. Now this particular tribe, Banu Makhzum, this clan was in charge of warfare, in management of affairs of the war. They basically bred horses, they trained soldiers, and they were the ones who deputed le leaders for particular armies, commanders and generals for armies. So my dear brothers in Islam, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, he grew up in a tribe where from a small age, at a very tender age, all of the youngsters were trained to be good horsemen. They were trained to be skilled archers. They were trained to be accurate archers. They were trained to be strong swordsmen. So Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, at a very ten tender age, he was a skilled horseman. He was a skilled ho horseman. For if you have, in other words, if you are a Makhzumi, if you are a Makhzumi, in other words, if you are from the tribe of Banu Makhzum, no doubt you have to be, or in other words, you have to train yourself to be a skilled warrior. A skilled warrior. But now the other distinguishing factor about Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, was that he was from a very rich family. Basically, he was considered as a prince of the Quraysh due to the fact that his father, Walid, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, he was the chieftain. He was the leader of Banu Makhzum, of the tribe Banu Makhzum. Now, Quraysh divides itself into three sub-tribes and 
Banu Hashim, for example, the leader was Abdul Muttalib. After was Abu Talib. Now, Banu Makhzum, the leader was Al-Walid, the father of Khalid ibn Al-Walid. So Khalid ibn Al-Walid, radiyallahu anhu, he grew up in a lap of luxury. He did not have to work. He did not have to go out to search for food or uh, bread for his family. But rather, all of that was taken care of. So he spent his whole day, or most of his time, most of his youth, becoming a warrior and training his skills of fighting, combat, etc. And he used to spend time with his friends. You know, he had a, he spent his time in the lap of luxury with no worry whatsoever. And he was given horses in charge. He had to look after horses, untrained young horses. He had to break these horses in. He had to train these horses. So he was an extremely skilled horseman. Likewise, even other skills of combat, gradually he started to master each skill, making himself a complete warrior. Likewise, my dear brothers in Islam, he was an extremely powerful, strong wrestler. You see, wrestling at that time, amongst the Arabs, it was a very famous sport. We even have the incident of the wrestler known as Rukana. I'm not sure whether you're aware of this story. There was a wrestler, a wrestler who prided himself in being the strongest amongst the Quraysh. His name was Rukana. He was one of the uncles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So once when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was passing by the marketplace, Rukana calls Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for a challenge. This uh, narration or this incident is mentioned in Al-Bidayah wa Nihaya of Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, the student of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. Rukana calls Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and challenges Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I challenge you for a bout with me, for a duel with me, for a wrestling match with me. I challenge you to put me in the sense, pin me down on the ground. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after a few moments, he accepted the challenge. He accepted the challenge. Even though Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not jump at the opportunity and say, yeah, I'm coming to fight you. He, when he kept on challenging, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted the challenge. Now, know this, my dear brothers in Islam, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was an extremely strong individual. Allahu Akbar. Rukana is nothing for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the match starts. Rukana wrestles with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and without any difficulty, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam slams Rukana to the ground and pins him. Rukana was amazed. How could this happen? I'm the strongest man in Quraysh. How could this happen? Yeah? So, he says again, can we have a round two? Now there's a round two. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam slams Rukana down again in round two. He says round three again. And round three too, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam slams Rukana down without any difficulty. Allahu Akbar. Rukana gets up flabbergasted. He's amazed. He's questioning himself, how could this have happened? I am disgraced. How could this happen? And he voices this question out. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very calmly smiles and says, Ya Rukana, do you want to see something that is even more amazing? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looks at a tree and he calls that tree. The tree basically pulls its roots out and start, starts approaching Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks the tree to go back and the tree went back to its original location and rooted itself there. Now there is a difference of opinions in regard to this uh, narration. Some of which say that Rukana, after witnessing all of this, immediately embraced Islam. Because that was one of the conditions in regard to the challenge. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stipulated a condition that I will, I will accept your challenge. And if I pin you down, you have to accept Islam. So some of the narrations say that he did accept Islam and some of the narrations say he even rejected all of those clear signs of Rasulullah 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So coming back to Khalid ibn al-Walid radiyallahu an, he was a wrestler. He was a very strong wrestler. Now in regard to his description, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiyallahu an, as he grew to manhood, he attained a great height over six feet. Allahu Akbar. A great height over six feet. His shoulders widened. Now naturally, wide shoulders indicate a man with an extremely good physique. So, his shoulders widened, his chest expanded, and the muscles hardened on his lean, you could call it ripped, shredded, athletic body. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. His beard appeared full and thick on his face. He had a fantastic physique, a forceful personality, and fantastic skills at riding and the use of different weapons. He was a master of different weapons. The spear, the bow and arrow, the sword, and all of this, he had mastered all of these weapons. So gradually, my dear brothers in Islam, he soon became a popular, a very famous and much admired figure amongst the Arabs of Mecca. Now we discussed about his tribe, his description, now his family. In general, Arabs have large families because they marry. They marry multiple women. So they had large families. Now the family of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, he had siblings. He had four brothers. Walid, now his father's name is also al-Walid, so don't get confused. He also had a brother who was named after his father. Al-Walid, Hisham, Ammara, and Abdul Sham. Four brothers. So with Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, his father had five sons and two sisters. Their names were Fatta and Fatima. These were the two sisters of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an. So coming back to his father, we touched on him in the beginning. Walid ibn al-Mughira, chieftain of the Makhzumi tribe of the Banu Makhzum, extremely wealthy, extremely wealthy, and also one of the enemies of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before we continue, there is a small point to be touched there. In regard to the enemies of our Nabi, of our Prophet alayhi salatu wa we basically have a spectrum. A spectrum with two extremes. One extreme, they used to stoop to lowly levels in regard to insulting our beloved Master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam flinging remarks of sarcasm, smear com- campaigns, planning, devising plots to humiliate and disgrace our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The other spectrum were enemies of our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but they had an element of nobility, of dignity within them. So they used to draw a line, they used to show enmity to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hostility to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but they drew a line and they did not use to stoop low to tactics such as disgracing our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and etc. They used to only show their enmity by disagreeing with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now two examples for that, at this extreme, Abu Lahab, Allahu Akbar, Abu Lahab, one of the uncles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but continuously planning, devising, plotting against our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it was his clique or his group that planned whilst Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in salah to uh, go and dump the intestines or the remains of some animal, a dead animal on his body. This was the kind of lowly plan that that extreme used to plan about. Whilst the other extreme we have Abu Sufyan, who later on embraced Islam, Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan, he was an individual he, who did not stoop to such lowly tactics, but rather he showed his enmity and hostility uh, by disagreeing with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now as for Walid, he was right in the middle of that spectrum. He was not on either one of the two extremes, he was right in the middle. He also did not participate in any smear campaigns and all of those things, but nor was he, uh, I don't know, gentle if you will, like Abu Sufyan. He was an established enemy of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Likewise, Walid, Walid, the father of Khalid, radiallahu an, he had an inflated ego. And what I mean by that is, he was proud of himself. He had this superiority complex. 
he thought of himself as the greatest man in Mecca, the father of Khalid radiallahu anh. He thought of himself so much that he even questioned why, why on earth did God send the Quran upon a youngster from Banu Hashim? Whilst I am the greatest of the Quraysh, why could not the Quran have descended upon me or else the leader of Ta'if? Because he considered himself as the greatest and the leader of Ta'if, the second greatest. Now in regard to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down an ayah. وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنُ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِّنَ الْقَرْيَتَيْنِ عَظِيمٌ In regard to his statement, Allah the Almighty, he says, and they said, why was this Quran not sent down upon a great man from one of the two cities? الْقَرْيَتَيْنِ عَظِيمٌ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِّنَ الْقَرْيَتَيْنِ عَظِيمٌ why wasn't this Qur'an sent down upon a great man from one of the two cities, Mecca and Toy? This was the statement of Walid, the father of Khalid radiallahu anh. Now another incident in regard to his father, he tried to strike a deal with our master sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is why I say he's in the middle of that spectrum. He did not want bloodshed, he did not want wars and fighting over these things. Rather he thought let us negotiate, let us come to a compromise between Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So he goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he says, Ya Muhammad, you know what? Let's strike a deal. One day we will worship Allah and the next day you worship our God. Let's have, uh, uh, then it will be a win-win situation, you know. One day we worship Allah and the other day you and your followers worship our God. There will be harmony, there will be no issues amongst us. Allah the Almighty immediately reveals the surah and I think all of you all are very familiar with this surah. Surah Al-Kafirun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inform them, the kuffar, O kuffar, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا The whole surah comes down. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ أَوْ The translation goes along the lines of these words that we will not worship what you all are worshipping, nor will you all worship what we worship. At the end of the day, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَذِينَ Let your religion for you and our religion for us. The deal is closed. There is no negotiation, no compromise. Likewise, to highlight that element of nobility I was talking about in him, he once called upon a council amongst the kuffar to discuss or to plan in regard to unifying all of their voices against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He came about saying, you know what, we all have to sit down and come upon one statement that we will tell everybody, we will spread this news about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Basically, any caravans coming into Mecca, let's go and tell them that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is this and this. So let us all sit down and unify upon one statement. So what shall we say about him? Some of them came up with an idea, let us say that he's a madman. Let us say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a madman. Now Walid, he says, you know, we all know the symptoms of a madman and we don't see that on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so we cannot say he's a madman okay let's then call him a fortune teller we all know the symptoms of a fortune teller how can we call him a fortune teller okay then let's call him a magician we all know what magicians do and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not doing what magicians do okay then let's say that he's a liar he says we know of him as an Amin. we know of him as the most truthful we know that we used to entrust our trust by him. He is not a liar. 
He's not a liar. So we cannot say this about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Finally the people give up and they say, you know what, you are our leader and why don't you tell us what to say? So Al-Walid, he says, okay, give me some time. Give me some time, give me a few days, I will think about it and get back to you. He goes back home. He goes back home and starts pacing back and forth in his home. Back and forth, thinking, frowning, scowling. Nobody knew about this pacing back and forth. Nobody knew about these thoughts. Finally, he comes out and says what he has to say. Now remember, nobody knew about this, what was happening in his house. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Surah Al-Muddathir. ذَرْنِي وَمَنْ خَلَقُتُ وَحِيدًا وَجَعَلْتُ لَهُ مَالًا مَمْدُودًا وَبَنِينَ شُهُودًا وَمَهَدْتُ لَهُ تَمْهِيدًا ثُمَّ يَطْمَعُ أَنْ أَزِيدَ كَلَّا إِنَّهُ كَانَ لِآيَاتِنَا عَنِيدًا سَأُرْهِقُهُ صَعُودًا إِنَّهُ فَكَّرَ وَقَدَّرَ فَقُتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرَ ثُمَّ قُتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرَ ثُمَّ نَظَرَ ثُمَّ عَبَسَ وَبَسَرَ ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ وَاسْتَكْبَرَ فَقَالَ إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا سِحْرٌ يُؤْثَرُ إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا قَوْلُ الْبَشَرِ الله سبحانه وتعالى informs our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam leave him to me leave me to deal with the one I created Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying and I created him and then I bestowed upon him ample means now when we say Al-Walid was a rich man Allah the Almighty is saying in the Quran وَجَعَلْتُ لَهُ مَالًا مَمْدُودًا and we gave him ample wealth so that alone is confirmation that he was an extremely rich man. And we gave him sons, five sons. We gave him sons abiding in his presence who used to listen to him. And we made life smooth and easy for him. But yet he desires that I should give more. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Nay, for lo, he has been stubborn to our revelations, to our signs. On him I shall impose a fearful punishment, for lo, he did consider, then he planned. Okay? Destroyed is he because of how he planned. Now this was the facing back and forth in his house. He was planning. Self-destroyed is he because of how he planned. And again, destroyed is he for how he planned. Summa nabar. Then he looked, and then he frowned. And then he scowled, he showed displeasure, then he turned away in pride. He turned away in pride and he said that this is nothing. This is nothing other than magic of some sort. This is nothing other than a speech of a mortal man. So this father of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, he goes to that council and tells them, you know what, let's say that it is some type of a magic, not that he is a magician, let's just say that it is some form, some kind of a magic, and that it is a statement of a mere mortal to be disregarded. Another incident, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now after some time, there was once an instance where our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was talking, was inviting a few noblemen of the Quraysh, and one of them was Walid. One of them was the father of Khalid radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was inviting them, was calling them. And they were on the verge of accepting what our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was saying. And Khalid radiallahu anhu's father was uh, amongst them. Suddenly they hear the sound of tok, tok, tok. A sound of a stick. A sound of a stick. And what happens? They all turn around to see a blind Sahabi radiallahu an coming towards Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and talks to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The minute these noblemen, including Al-Walid, saw this blind Sahabi, they said, Oh, so these are your followers, weak, disabled people. 
No thank you and they move away. They move away. Now remember, they were on the verge of accepting what our Master Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was putting forward to them. At this point, they turned away. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was frustrated. He was disappointed. You know, I was trying hard. I was trying hard. I was about to win them over. So he was disappointed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals ayat. Abata wa tawalla an jaahu al-a'man wa ma yudhrika la'allahu yazzakaha aw yazzakahu fatanfa'ahu al-zikra amma man istaghna fa'anta lahu وما عليك ألا يزكى وأما من جاءك يسعى وهو يخشى فأنت عنه تلهى عبث وتولى The Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام frowned and turned away أن جاءه الأعمى because a blind man interrupted. He came and interrupted the Sahabi radiallahu an. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that in regard to Amma man istaghna, as for the one who, who thinks himself that he does not need this deen or the signs of Allah or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for you to give them attention. In other words, the nobleman then it is not upon you, Ya Rasulullah, if they do not become purified or if they do not accept the message, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not to be found for. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to inform our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَأَمَّا مَنْ جَاءَكَ يَسْعَى But as for the one, the blind man who came to you striving for knowledge, he wanted to hear what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was saying. He was so eager. Whilst these noblemen, they were finding faults. They were trying to find something to accuse Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the blind sahabi, no. He loved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was coming eagerly. وَأَمَّا مَنْ جَاعَكَ يَسْعَى وَهُوَ يَخْشَى While that blind sahabi was fearing Allah. فَأَنْتَ عَنْهُ تَلَهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was informing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that you are distracted from him. These ayat, my dear brothers in Islam, they were revealed in regard to these noblemen, okay, this incident with them, and the father of Khalid radiallahu an was also amongst them. Now we move on to the Battle of Badr, Allahu Akbar. The Battle of Badr was the first major clash between the Muslims and their enemies, between the Muslims and the enemies of Islam. The first major clash. Now in regard to this battle, Khalid radiallahu an and his father. Now remember, Khalid radiallahu an has still not embraced Islam. So Khalid and his father were not present. They were not present for this battle because Khalid's father had passed away. Khalid radiallahu an had gone on a, on a business trip or something like that with a caravan and he was absent for that particular battle. Now how many were the Muslims on that day? 313 Muslims. The day of the Battle of Badr, 313 Muslims against 1,000 infidels, against 1,000 kuffar, 1,000 against 313. So after an, about an hour or two of severe fighting between the two armies, what happened was the Quraysh, they fled the battlefield in disorder. They fled the battlefield. The victory was for the Muslims. The final of the Quraysh, they had all fallen in battle or they had been taken as PWs, prisoners of war. Alright, prisoners of war. Now, a total of 70 infidels had been killed. 70 kuffar, 70 kuffar were killed. Another 70 were captured by the Muslim army. And the cost of the Muslim army was that they lost only 14 soldiers. Out of 313, only 14 soldiers the Muslim army had lost. Okay. So now from amongst those who were killed from the Quraysh, 17 of them were from the Bani Makhzum, the tribe of Khalid radiallahu an. Most of them were cousins or nephews or uncles, relations of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an. Abu Jahl had been killed. Abu Jahl 
had been killed. Hamdala, the son of Abu Sufyan, had been killed. And Khalid radiallahu anhu's brother, Al-Walid, we spoke about him in the beginning, Al-Walid who was named after his father, he had been taken as a POW. As a POW. Now he was with the Muslims in Medina. Now, my dear brothers in Islam, it was not from the Sunnah of our Master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or for that matter of the Muslim army, to put up jails, to put up prisons, and lock up the POWs. No, no. Rather, every prisoner of war was assigned to an Ansar who used to keep him in his home as a guest. Allahu Akbar. As a guest. So Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu's brother al-Walid was kept in an Ansari's house and naturally he must have witnessed the beauty of Islam. Because this was one of the hikmah, the wisdom behind our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam doing this. News goes to Khalid radiallahu an in regard to his brother's capture. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to put up ransoms in regard to the POWs. And it, it wasn't a fixed figure, it would depend on the family. If the POW was from a rich family, the ransom was of a high figure. If he was from a poor family, then the ransom also was a lower figure. Now... Khalid radiallahu anhu's family, one of the richest families, Allahu Akbar, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stipulated a price of 4,000 dinar, a very, very exorbitant, high ransom for the brother of Khalid radiallahu anhu. If you want to free him, 4,000 dinars had to be paid. Khalid radiallahu anhu sets out from Mecca with 4,000 dinars to go pay the ransom and get his brother. He reaches Medina, he reaches Medina after, it's a long journey, so perhaps a day or two, he, we don't have GMCs and things like that, like how we have today from Mecca to Medina, it's basically a horseback, yeah, or perhaps a caravan, perhaps a day or two, so he comes, and he had to return from wherever he was, he, I told you he, was, he, he had been gone on a business trip or something like that. So when he reached Medina, he goes straight to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he informed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I have come with 4,000 dinars. 4,000 dinars, the ransom of my brother and this is the money. He hands the money over to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informs the Sahaba, Rizwanullah ta'ala alayhi wa to let Khalid's, uh, Khalid's brother go free. So what happened? Now, it was after a long journey, Khalid radiallahu an takes his brother and they go to the outskirts of Medina and pitch camp there for the night. For the night. They stay there for the night. In the morning, Khalid radiallahu an who wakes up to see his brother is missing. His brother is missing. To see his brother had stealthily gone back to Medina and had embraced Islam at the hands of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now why did he not do it earlier? Because he did not want the Muslims or the Muslim in the sense of Sahaba Ridwanullah Ta'ala alayhi majma'een to think that because of the 4,000 dinar ransom, it is because of that high figure, it is because of that he is accepting Islam. No. He waited for his brother to come in with the money, pay the money to the Muslim and then he goes back and embraces Islam to prove that I am coming sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This left Khalid radiallahu anhu in utter confusion. What's going on? I go and pay 4,000 dinars, such a high figure, and my brother goes running back and embraces Islam. Why could he have not done that before? Why did he make me come all the way from Mecca with such a big amount of money, pay it and then go embrace Islam? He did not understand. He was in confusion, but he headed back to Medina. To Mecca, I'm sorry. So now we move on to the next incident which took place in the Battle of Uhud. Now this is an extremely interesting incident. In the Battle of Uhud, the Battle of Uhud, this was in the seventh, it was on the seventh of Shawwal, three years after the Hijrah of our Master Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, exactly uh, a year and a week after the Battle of Badr. Exactly a year and a week after the Battle of Badr. Now, the two armies faced each other in their orderly ranks. Now, what was the number of the Muslimun? 700 Muslims, 700 Muslims against 
3,000 kuffar. Allahu Akbar. 3,000 kuffar. 700 Muslims against 3,000 kuffar. Look at the difference in number. 3,000 of them are coming to attack the Muslims. Now what had happened in, bat- in the battle of Uhud, behind the Muslims stood 14 women. The women of the Muslim army. Their task, they were appointed to give water to the soldiers. They were appointed to carry the, the wounded or the injured soldiers of the Muslim army to the camp and to dress up their wounds and noble tasks as such. Amongst these women was Fatima radiallahu anha, the daughter of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the wife of Ali radiallahu anha. The Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took up his position with the left flank of the Muslim army, the left hill. Now my dear brothers in Islam, please focus with me because I'll have to describe the scene. The battle of Uhud, there was a low hill, a low mountain where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam placed 50 archers. 50 archers with their bows and arrows on the top and they, their task was to protect the rear of the Muslim army from that hill. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's clear command to them was use your arrows against the enemy cavalry keep the cavalry off our back the enemies off our back and as long as you hold your position our rear is safe the rear of the Muslim army is safe because it was basically an infantry they were all on foot mostly so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's instruction to them was if you hold your position The rear of the army of the army will be safe. On no account must you leave this position. If you, even if you see us winning, do not join us. If you see us losing, do not come down to help us. Stick to your position and do what I say. This is the command of our master, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, my dear brothers in Islam, this this group of 50 archers were, were under the command of Abdullah ibn Jubayr, radhiyallahu an. Now the Muslim army kept on reciting Hasbun Allah Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil Allah is sufficient for us as Allah is the best disposer of affairs Allahu Akbar My dear brothers in Islam it was in this battle it was in this battle that that Hamza radiyallahu an the lion of Allah the lion of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was martyred he Hamza radiyallahu an he had killed two men he had killed two men Now the, 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 the battle is going on fully fle- full fledged he had killed two men and he found a third kafir approaching him an infidel he rushes to him that infidel's name was Saba ibn Abdul Uzza Saba ibn Abdul Uzza Hamza radiyallahu anhu knew him and he called him come to me come come to me o son of the skin cutter <laughs> o son of the skin cutter because his mother used to perform circumcision in mecca so he called him o son of the skin cutter come forward and face me this man comes to face Hamza radiyallahu an Hamza radiyallahu anhu whilst he is in a duel with him There was a person observing this fight and this was Wahshi Wahshi who was a slave he was a slave he had been appointed by him to kill Hamza radiyallahu an now he was there was a, an incident in the previous battle he was observing behind a rock at this duel between Hamza radiyallahu an who was as we know the lion of Allah the lion of our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam such a brave sahabi he was aiming his spear at Hamza radiyallahu an from behind a rock and my dear brothers in Islam he had an unerring aim he was a skilled uh, javelin thrower if you will or spear thrower you understand he was aiming hamza radiyallahu anhu but it was a cowardly act hamza radiyallahu anhu was bold you come and fight man to man but this man was hiding behind a rock and aiming him the minute hamza radiyallahu anhu struck this this uh, kafir this kafir this infidel and killed him with one blow the man i said who approached hamza radiyallahu anhu to attack him wahshi was behind a rock through the spear The spear went straight through Hamza radiyallahu anhu's stomach, 
killing him then and there. Allahu Akbar. The lion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam falls to the ground. Allahu Akbar. It was in this battle. It was in this battle that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lost his uncle Hamza radiallahu anhu. Now the same Wahshi, the same slave was the one who embraced Islam later on and he used that same spear that he used to kill Hamza radiallahu an to kill Musaylama al-Kazzab Musaylama the false prophet it was Wahshi who later embraces Islam so my dear brothers in Islam coming back to the battle Khalid and Ikrimah Khalid and Ikrimah Khalid the son of Al-Walid Ikrimah the son of Abu Jahl now they were put in charge of two flanks of the army the right side flank and the left flank of the army now, my dear brothers in Islam, Khalid radiallahu an was hawk eye. He was hawk eye. He had very keen eyes. He had the eyesight of a hawk. Hawk. He was looking, he was studying the, the, the battle. And now what was happening, the Quraysh were beginning to run away from the battlefield because they could not face the Muslims. They could not face the Muslim army. They were running away. There was a lot of disarray and confusion in the battlefield. At that moment, what happened was the Muslims thought that they had the upper hand and it looked as if the Muslims were, in other words, enjoying victory. The archers who were on top of the hill, they also noticed this victory, kind of a victory, the semi-victory. And some of the archers said, you know what, let's all go down and partake of the booty and enjoy in the victory. Now the leader, Abdullah ibn Jubayr radiallahu anhu, immediately says no. The command of Rasulullah wasallam was clear that we have to stay, hold our positions, come what may. Do not leave your position. The archer said, you know, Rasulullah wasallam was talking during the battle. The battle is over. Everybody is enjoying the spoils of war. Let us also go. And he could not contain the 50 archers. It was a misunderstanding of the command of Rasulullah wasallam. That small misunderstanding resulted in all of them leaving the hill and rushing down to the plains of Uhud. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an immediately noticed this. He was hawk-eyed. He noticed this. He saw the archers coming down and he gathered his squadron of soldiers and rushed from behind and climbed the hill climbed that small hill and he attacked the remaining archers who were nine or ten in number. They resisted gallantly, bravely, but they could not withstand the strength or the brunt of Khalid radiallahu an and his squadron. They killed all of the archers who were on top of the hill and by that they began to attack the Muslims from the rear. Allahu Akbar. Khalid radiallahu an started attacking the Muslim army, killing them left, right and center. Take that and take this, he said. I am Abu Sulaiman. I am Abu Sulaiman. Khalid radiallahu an. My dear brothers in Islam, this was one of the battles through only Khalid radiallahu an. Basically it was the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yet... Allah the Almighty used Khalid radiallahu anhu in this instance and Khalid radiallahu anhu due to his prowess in strategy basically warfare strategy he identified a weak spot or a blind spot in the, in, in, in the, in the army and attacked the Muslims resulting, resulting in a huge loss for the Muslim army and you can call it a semi-victory for the Kuffar even though that battle was not a decisive battle where the victory was not very decisive a lot of problems issued where even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was badly hurt badly hurt the links of the helmet of our master sallallahu alayhi wasallam went deep into his jaw and the Sahabi radiallahu an a Sahabi radiallahu an he had to basically pull out the, 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 the links from the face of our master sallallahu alayhi wasallam using his teeth and he lost his teeth due to that and a rumor was spread that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam had been assassinated but in reality it was Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu an who had been martyred in that particular battle so my dear brothers in Islam it was through Khalid radiallahu anhu's strategic thinking that he turned the tables in that particular battle another incident two years later now Two years later, this is during the Battle of Khandaq. This is during the Battle of Khandaq. The Battle of Khandaq is basically the Battle of the Trenches. 
the sad part is that many of our youngsters today we know the biographies of athletes we know the biographies of sportsmen we know their favorite food whether it's pasta noodles or spaghetti perhaps we know their favorite colors all of these actors and actresses we like their pages we do all of this but when it comes to the sahaba ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhim ajma'in when it comes to the history the golden history of islam the legacy that our religion left behind for us we are clueless we are in the dark my dear brothers in islam oh sons of islam put your role models straight do not follow those role models that lead you to wise transgression and sin rather take role models who were legends of Islam the heroes of Islam such great personalities like our master sallallahu alaihi wasallam the sahaba ridwanullah ta'ala alayhim ajma'in because they are the role models that we need to be following that we need to be following this is the battle of khandaq the battle of the trenches this was in medina my dear brothers in islam 10000 strong kuffar were heading marching towards medina two years later rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam receives intelligence that the army is approaching the muslims are worried how are we to protect medina allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings about an idea to through salman al farisi radiyallahu anhu salman the persian he goes and informs rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam ya rasulullah let us dig trenches now digging trenches was not the warfare of the arab they did not know of this tactic this warfare tactic but this was from the persians to basically dig a trench around medina medina was in the middle you dig a trench around deep trenches so that no one can cross over so the the kuffar who are coming who are approaching they did not know what was going on the sahaba ridwanullah ta'ala alayhim ajma'in they started digging trenches deep trenches some of the munafiqun started saying why should we dig trenches why are we wasting time why is the kuffar is coming let us pre- prepare for war they were hypocrites at the end of the day but the sahaba ridwanullah ta'ala alayhim ajma'in including our master sallallahu alayhi wasallam struggled and involved themselves in digging trenches now there was a tribe known as banu quraiza banu quraiza was a jewish tribe rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam came up with an agreement with them to for them to look after the rear of medina while the trenches were in the front to look after the, the the front part of medina now my dear brothers in islam what happened was banu quraiza breached the agreement and there is a beautiful story in regard to a sahabi named as abu lubaba but time does not permit me to touch it so i move on to the other incident that took place basically banu quraiza they breached the agreement they were a jewish tribe they breached the agreement and they let a few kuffar slip in through the barracks and attack the muslim army from the rear So there was an issue afterwards with the Muslim army and Banu Quraida but what happened was now that Banu Quraida had turned tables basically there was one particular Jewish scout now I told you the women of Medina were at the back now what I'm trying to highlight here is my dear brothers in Islam look at the bravery of the women of the sahabiyat ridwanullah ta'ala alayhim ajma'in Allahu akbar where are we we are nothing we are cowards this Jewish scout was scouting around Medina at the back Safiya رضي الله عنها الله اكبر دي انت اوف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم نوتيسز ذا سكاوت شي راشز تو حسان رضي الله عنه هي از نون از حسان ذا بويت هي واز ا بويت شي راشز تو هيم اند تيلز ذا يا حسان اي نوتيس ا جويش سكاوت ات ذا باك اوف مدينه اي ثينك يو جو يو بيتر جو تشيك ات اوت اند جيت ريد اوف هيم نو حسان رضي الله عنه واز ا فيري تيميد يانغستر so he tells her may allah bless you o daughter of abdul muttalib you know that that work is not for me you know i'm not really suitable for all that uh, checking them out and driving them out she gives him a look as if like you know what are you doing here then she gives him that look she goes and takes a club you know a club the club that the flintstones have the club She takes a club like a baseball bat, a big fat club, and she goes behind to where this Jewish scout was. She goes behind him, gives him one blow on his skull, which basically cracks his skull into two and he falls down dead. Safiya radiyallahu anha. Where are we? 
She goes now to Hassan radiallahu anhu and says, Ya Hassan, I've done the job. But you know what? It is not proper for a woman to undress a man and take his booty. So you go and take the booty of that man. Hassan radiallahu anhu says, O oh daughter of Abdul Muttalib, even the booty is not for me, it is for you. And uh, he leaves it at that, Allahu Akbar. So my dear brothers in Islam, in regard to the incident of Abu Lubaba, we will leave it. And we move on to the incident of Amr ibn Abi Wood. Amr ibn Abi Wood was a tall, towering giant of a man. He was from the Kuffar. Now what happened, now what happened, coming back to the, uh, the enemies, the infidel army had approached the trenches. They approached the trenches now. And they were amazed. What is this new tactic that they have deployed? How can we cross over? Once again, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, used the strategy, brought he challenged some of the Muslims forward to cross the trenches basically and come. And there was a few skirmishes that, you know, a few fights, a few duels that took place outside of the trenches. Now, one of these skirmishes was between this person, this individual known as Amr ibn Abi Wud. He was a tall, towering giant, a huge figure. When he was on his horse, it looked as if he was some kind of a tower. He was that huge and so muscular, so built. He comes forward and says, I am Amr ibn Abi Wud. I am Amr ibn Abi Wud. I am the greatest warrior in Arabia. I am invincible. I am this. I am that. You know, like Jack and the Beanstalk, that fee, five, four, five. He starts screaming out there in the front. And he says all of this and he says, Is there anyone from amongst you who has the courage to meet me in personal combat? He challenges. Now it was said that in regard to him, this person, Amr ibn Abi Wud, he was equal to 500 horsemen. 500 horsemen, Amr ibn Abi Wud. He could lift a horse by himself and body slam it. He could lift a horse by himself and hurl it to the ground. Amr ibn Abi Wood. He could pick up one calf, a calf of a cow, with his left hand and he could use that as a shield in combat. This was Amr ibn Abi Wood. He said, just take a calf like that and use it as a shield. He was such a huge man. The stories about him are endless. Now he starts challenging. He says, no, oh, no one to meet me or are you all women, cowards? Is the Prophet amongst you all? Can he not send someone? He starts, you know, starts instigating them and challenging them. Ali radiallahu anhu could not contain himself. He could not contain himself. He goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ali radiallahu anhu, youngster, my dear brothers in Islam, youngster, in his twenties, Allahu Akbar. He goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, permit me to go out and fight him in personal combat. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam keeps quiet and he says, Go and sit down, Ya Ali. It is Amr. It is Amr. He is not an easy character. Ali radiallahu anhu goes and sits down. He, Amr, now he sees, Oh, coward! No one to come and meet me. He starts taunting them. Huh? He starts taunting them. After some time, Ali radiallahu anhu gets up again. Ya Rasulullah, just permit me to go. Ya Ali, go and sit down. He goes and sits. A third time, now his taunts are getting unbearable. Ali radiallahu anhu loses it. He goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam notices that twinkle in his eyes, in Ali radiallahu anhu's eyes. That twinkle. He knew now that he can't stop Ali radiallahu anhu. He says, okay. He permits Ali radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ties his turban across Ali radiallahu anhu. And he hands over a sword to Ali radiallahu anhu. His sword. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sword, he hands it over. Now my dear brothers in Islam, O oh sons of Islam, this sword was a special sword. This sword was a special sword. This sword which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave Ali radiallahu anhu had once belonged to a kafir by the name of Munabba bin Hajjaj. That man had been killed in the battle of Badr and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had used the sword. Now he gives it to Ali radiallahu anhu and my dear brothers in Islam from that day onwards, 
from that day onwards, that sword has killed more men in fair combat than any sword in history. And that sword is known as Zulfiqar. The sword is known as Zulfiqar. The sword has a name. It is known as Zulfiqar. It was a sword, a huge sword with a double-edged blade. It had two edges on the blade. This was the sword that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave Ali radiallahu anhu. Ali radiallahu anhu takes the sword and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, protect Ali, protect him. He goes, they meet in combat, fierce combat. Before the combat, Ali radiallahu anhu offers him two proposals. Ya Amr, I give you two proposals because I know that you are a man who accepts one of the two proposals. Amr says, what is it? He says, I call you to accept Islam, to accept Allah as your Lord and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In other words, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the final messenger. He says, that is nonsense. What is the other proposal? The other proposal is, I call you for personal combat. Amr says, because he was related to Ali radiallahu an, I do not want to engage in a duel with you, O oh my nephew. Ali radiallahu anhu says, you may not, but I am eager to engage in combat with you. This enrages Amr, who jumps off his horse and comes charging to Ali radiallahu anhu. The swords clash and there is a fierce battle. In other words, a combat that takes place between the giant Amr and Ali radiallahu anhu. Now what happens? At one point, it was a fierce battle, back and forth, swords clashing. Amr is amazed that such a youngster, how can he last for so long in a duel with me? With me, the giant, the invincible. Finally, Ali radiallahu anhu leaves the sword aside, jumps across Amr, catches him by his throat, slams him to the ground, basically body slams him to the ground and pins him by his throat. Amr now is pinned to the ground. He's disgraced. He feels ashamed. He tries to break free, but the grip of Ali radiallahu anhu is of steel. This was the strength and stamina of the youngsters of those days, my dear brothers in Islam. We are basically blobs of jellies today. We are blobs of jellies today. I'm serious. Youngster, he cannot break free. Khalid ibn al-Walid, in, the, in a dash, in the twinkling of an eye, he gets his dagger out and keeps it at his neck. Keeps it at his neck. Now Amr, this giant, has been disgraced. He's so disgraced that he cannot take it anymore. He cannot take it anymore. He looks at Ali radiallahu an and spits at his face. He spits at Ali radiallahu anhu's face. Ali radiallahu an. And now what the giant thought was, now I have spat on his face, he is going to slit my throat. Ali radiallahu anhu leaves him and gets up. The giant is amazed. What made you do that? Ali radiallahu anhu says that all this while I was fighting for Allah. But now that you spat on my face, now if I kill you, it will be because of my anger. Or it will be as a personal vengeance that I have taken against you. So I will not kill you. The giant seizes the opportunity, grabs for his sword and rushes to stab Ali radiallahu anhu as he walks away. Ali radiallahu anhu sensing it, the Muslim army nor the Quraysh army saw what happened. All they saw was the sunlight flashing on Zulfiqar, on the sword of Ali radiallahu anhu and the head of the giant rolling on the ground. Allah Allahu Akbar. The giant, his body, he, no more, no head. It was just swaying from corner to corner and then it crashed to the ground. The earth did not shake because the colossal body of this giant fell, my dear brothers in Islam. But the hills and the mountains of that valley echoed with Allahu Akbar. Two thousand Muslims screamed out Allahu Akbar because of this victory. Allahu Akbar. My dear brothers in Islam, this was an incident which took place in that battle. Now we move on to another incident to highlight whether we can say, can a person say that Khalid was a better 
commander or a better general than Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam no you can never ever say that because this incident alone proves that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is anyway the best he is the best commander the best general the best soldier he out with khalid radiyallahu an there was once an incident in other words rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the news goes to the kuffar that he is heading from Mac- medina to makka they send khalid radiyallahu an with an army to intercept the muslim army and stop them Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam out with Khalid in such a way Khalid radiyallahu anhu master of strategies he goes to one corner thinking that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Muslim army will be there <laughs> and he finds no one there while Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had reached Hudaybiyah already and that's where the treaty of Hudaybiyah was enacted so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam out with Khalid radiyallahu anhu in that instant so my dear brothers in Islam Now after all of these instances till Khalid radiyallahu anhu has not embraced Islam he goes to Ikrima Ikrima was one of his friends Ikrima the son of Abu Jahl he goes to him and he suddenly out of the blue after some time he just goes to him now we have understood what a great status that Khalid radiyallahu anhu held amongst the Quraysh he goes to him and he says ya Ikrima it is you know it is clear because once Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam informed the brother of Khalid radiyallahu anhu when Khalid radiyallahu anhu's brother was worried about him he said you know the likes of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying this the likes of khalid can never be negligent of the true light of islam along the lines of these words the likes of khalid in other words the person who is intelligent as khalid will nonetheless see the true hidayah of islam now khalid radiyallahu anhu goes to ikrima and he says yeah ikrima you know what It is evident to the intelligent mind that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he is neither a poet he is neither a poet nor is he a sorcerer nor is he a magician as the Quraysh claim falsely his message i think is truly divine it is incumbent on all sensible men in other words men who have common sense to follow him now ikrima alarm bells start ringing ya khalid what wrong what are you saying Are you bewitched? After all that we have done and after all that has happened, you are going to accept the message of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He rushes to Abu Sufyan and informs Abu Sufyan of this. Khalid is on the verge of accepting the message of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now because they have experienced all of this, Umar radiyallahu anhu was another legendary figure who crossed over. So now they worry if Khalid too goes over, we will lose. Abu Sufyan calls for Khalid radiyallahu anhu immediately and he says, Ya Khalid, what is wrong with you? And there goes a bit of an argument between Khalid radiyallahu anhu and Abu Sufyan. To finally, finally to which Abu Sufyan unsheathes his sword out in anger. To which Ikrima, the minute he says this, Whoa, whoa, take it easy. Ya Abu Sufyan. He sees the sword and he says, Just because... He is saying this, are you going to fight him? Are you going to fight him? Are you going to kill him? Are you going to kill one of our own? Put your sword back in or I also might consider what Khalid radiyallahu anhu is going to do. Now Khalid ibn al-Walid radiyallahu anhu realizes that this is not the place for him to be. In Mecca basically, tensions are arising and now that he is going to convert, he realizes it's not the place for me to remain. that very night he packed his belongings his weaponry his horse his all of his belongings and he leaves makkah that night as he takes the main highway if you will to medina he meets another two individuals in the dark of the night and he speaks to them and finds out that they are also headed to medina to embrace islam and who are they his very close friend amr ibn al-aaf the politician allahu akbar and the other sahabi whose name was usman ibn talha usman ibn talha now three of them they reach medina on the first of safar eight years after hijra and they accept islam at the hands of our beloved master muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam just before they accept islam Amr ibn Aaf, I told you, politician, very clever, 
He asked Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "We will accept on one condition that we want to know what about our previous sins, ah, huh? sins that we committed, or the things, the, the deeds that we committed against Islam before we accept uh, accepted Islam." Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam informs them, "Al Islam." Basically, the minute you accept Islam along the lines of these words, Islam deletes all of those previous sins. Nothing remains. You are given a clean slate to start off as if you were born on this day. Allahu Akbar. All three of them immediately embraced Islam. From that day, my dear brothers in Islam, Khalid radiallahu anhu used to spend a lot of time with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He began to love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, spe- he used to spend a lot of time with our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is one particular incident which I'll quickly mention. Once, Khalid radiallahu an, Fadl ibn Abbas radiallahu an, accompany Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to one of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's wife's houses, Maymuna radiallahu anha. As they go there and sit down to eat, a dish is placed in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looks at it, it is roasted meat. Roasted meat. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam outstretches his hand to partake of the meal. The women folk at the back of the house immediately start murmuring, inform Rasulullah, inform Rasulullah. And it was informed that, Ya Rasulullah, that is roasted lizard. Roasted lizard. Lizard in the sense, there is a type of a reptile which even in the outskirts of our city, Colombo, people consume it. It's like an iguana, a small lizard, roasted lizard. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immediately took his hand back. Now Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu was observing this. He asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, a haram huwa? Is it haram? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, no, it isn't. But my tribe, we aren't used to eating this type of meat. Rasul, then Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu very happily pulls the bowl towards him and whacks the whole dish. Whacks the whole dish while Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was observing. So because it was the favorite dish of Khalid radiallahu anhu. And even here people say that if you eat of that meat, your skin becomes so hard that the doctor will not be able to even inject you with an injection because the needle is bound to break. So anyway, it was the favorite food of Khalid radiallahu anhu. He liked it. So now coming back to another, the next incident that basically takes place. Khalid radiallahu anhu, now that he has embraced Islam, he gets a chance to prove himself. He gets a chance to prove himself. Because he was, he embraced Islam at the very latter stages. I mean after everyone. Just be, before the Fath of Mecca. Yeah? So now this is in regard to the bat- battle of Muta. The battle of Mu'ta, sorry, the battle of Mu'ta. Now in this particular battle, what happened was, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had sent an envoy. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had sent a messenger to the chieftain of a particular tribe. Yeah? So he had sent a messenger with a letter inviting this chieftain to embrace Islam. So while passing through Mu'ta, this particular envoy, this messenger of sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was intercepted and killed by another local chieftain of a tribe of that area whose name was Shurahbil ibn Amr. Now my dear brothers in Islam, this was a heinous and an evil crime amongst the Arabs because diplomatic envoys, they held a traditional sort of immunity from any type of an attack, no matter how hostile or how powerful a power they represented. Traditional immunity was granted. You cannot attack an envoy. You cannot attack a messenger who represents anybody. So this messenger of Rasulullah wasallam was attacked. And the news of this traveled very fast to Medina and it outraged the Medinites or the Muslims. Now an expedition was prepared to fight against that particular chieftain because of what he had done. My dear brothers in Islam, what happened was 3,000, a 3,000 strong army was prepared. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appointed the leaders. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appointed three 
important Sahabi, radiyallahu anhu, ridwan Allah ta'ala alayhi majma'in. The number one being the leader, Zayd ibn Haritha, radiyallahu anhu. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed them, if Zayd radiyallahu anhu were to fall, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, radiyallahu anhu, will take over the flag, in other words, the leadership of the army. If he falls too, Abdullah ibn Rawaha will take over the flag. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed them, if all three of them fall, if all three of them are martyred, let the army select a commander from amongst themselves. So Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an was part of the infantry of this army, basically a foot soldier. I mean, he embraced Islam very recently, yeah? So what happened? Now this army, they travel and the minute they reach a particular location, intelligence reaches them that Roman reinforcements had arrived, numbering up to a hundred thousand. A hundred thousand Romans had come in to help. Likewise, another hundred thousand Christian Arabs had come to help this particular tribe, Allahu Akbar. They were outnumbered, three thousand. How can they fight? There was so much of confusion going on, so much to the extent that the, the, two, the three leaders who were put in charge, one after the other, they started discussing as what to do. And an opinion came out that, that we better return back to Rasulullah to ask him what to do. Abdullah ibn Rawaha comes forward and he probes and urges the army forward by saying, Amen, we do not fight with numbers or weapons, but we fight with Iman. We fight with Iman. We go into battle with the choice of two glorious alternatives. Only two glorious alternatives. It is either victory or shahada. It is either victory or martyrdom. We do not run back from a battle. Allahu Akbar. This was the courage of the Muslim army. They go straight ahead. The battle begins. Full swing. What happened? The first leader who was appointed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Zayd radiallahu anhu, he dies. He was martyred. The minute Zayd radiallahu anhu was martyred, the flag is falling. Ja'far radiallahu anhu rushes and catches the flag. The flag of the Muslim army. And the fight goes on. Suddenly a person comes and chops the right hand of Ja'far radiallahu anhu away. He was holding the flag with his right hand. The right hand is chopped, he shifts the flag to his left hand. Whilst he's holding with his left hand, he goes on charging into the, 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 the field, into the battlefield, into the ranks of the, the army. Someone chops his left hand off. Immediately he hugs the flag with his bosom basically, because both of his arms are gone. And then an archer aims at him and... Uh, an arrow is shot at him directly to which he falls immediately. Allahu Akbar. The flag is falling. Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu notices it. He was fasting at that time on the battlefield. Look at their spirit. Allahu Akbar. He sees now the leadership is coming onto my shoulders. He takes a bag of dates. It was an optional fast. He needs strength. He pops in a few dates into his mouth to give him strength. And he rushes to the flag and holds on to the flag. Allahu Akbar. And then he is also martyred. At this time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in Medina. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam climbs the member, the pulpit. He informs the Muslims, O oh Muslims, O oh Ya Muslimun, the battle is going on like this. Zayd radiallahu anhu has been martyred, he is in Jannah. Ja'far radiallahu anhu has been killed, he has been martyred, and Allah the Almighty has blessed him with two wings in place of his two hands that he lost and he is flying in Jannah. And now Abdullah ibn Rawaha has taken the flag. Abdullah ibn Rawaha has been martyred. And now the leadership has shifted to Khalid radiallahu anhu. And it was on that day, my dear brothers in Islam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam titled Khalid radiallahu anhu, He is Sayfullah al-Maslul, 
the drawn sword of Allah that has been drawn against the kuffar. Allahu Akbar. My dear brothers in Islam, the sons of Islam, right after Abdullah ibn Rawaha drops the flag, another sahabi, Thabit ibn Arqam, takes the flag. He looks around. The Muslims are in a confusion as to whom we should appoint as the leader. They look around and they see the warrior. Khalid ibn al-Walid right in front of them. They say it, can, it cannot be anyone other than Khalid. The flag is given to Khalid radiallahu an. Even though he refuses that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not appoint me. But they say no you are the one who is most fitting to take over the leadership now. And my dear brothers in Islam. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an takes over the flag. The minute the Muslim army sees that they have got a new leader that basically rejuvenates the spirit of the Muslim army. Khalid radiallahu an rushes into the thick of the battle. He says in that battle and other sahaba confirm that he broke nine swords in that battle. Nine swords. That the, the last sword that was in his hands whilst he was fighting was the tenth sword. And all the other nine swords were basically in the bodies of the kuffar that he had killed whilst breaking the sword with his deadly blows. Allahu Akbar. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu immediately brings about a tactic. He rushes back to the Muslim army and he devises a strategy. He asks, he orders a few horsemen to go behind a particular hill and start galloping in a circle at an extremely fast pace to raise up or to uh, disturb some dust up to show as if, uh, as if an army has come. In other words, to give the kuffar the impression that reinforcements have arrived. And then what he does while the dust is being, while the dust is blowing all over the place, Khalid radiallahu an, he takes the right flank of the army and moves them to the left, the left to the right, the front to the back, the back to the front. And why he did that, my dear brothers in Islam, it was a tactic. So that the kuffar, now that they were accustomed to certain faces, suddenly they see new faces. They feel as if reinforcements have arrived. The dust is there. It is as if horsemen are coming in. And whilst there was all of this going on, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an instructed another group, another squadron to shout out takbir, Allahu Akbar, to signify that reinforcements have arrived. This confused the kuffar. This confused the kuffar, resulting in Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an saving the Muslim army from a humiliating defeat and he saved the Muslim army and they returned back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam my dear brothers in Islam when they returned back the Sahaba Ridwan Allah ta'ala alayhi majma'in informed Khalid ibn al-Walid about the title that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had titled him with and my dear brothers in Islam there is a mention of a Roman, of a, of a question a Roman once asked later on down the line. He asked, is he, because he became known afterwards as the sword of Allah. They began to ask one another, the Romans, they were such in such confusion. They asked, is he a sword of Allah which has really or literally been descended from the heavens because he, his blows were so deadly and if he was at the front of an army, if he was at the helm of an army, no doubt victory was sealed for the Muslims with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my dear brothers in Islam, swiftly moving on, he was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the conquest of Mecca, during the Fath of Mecca. After conquering Mecca, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sends Khalid radiallahu an, because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself goes to the Kaaba and destroys all of the idols, all of the 300 or idols there, and then he instructs Khalid radiallahu anhu to go to a particular village known as Nakhla to go because that was where the, the temple of a female goddess of theirs known as Uzza was placed. He instructs Khalid radiallahu anhu to go and destroy that temple. Khalid radiallahu anhu goes and destroys the idol and comes back. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Khalid, Ya Khalid, did you witness anything unusual when you, go, when you went there? Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu said, No, Ya Rasulullah. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed him, Ya Khalid, you haven't destroyed the idol, go back again. Khalid radiallahu anhu was upset. He rushes back to that village. 
And he goes there, he realizes that there is another temple. That is the main temple. He reaches the temple and the person who is in charge of that temple, the priest, he had hung a sword on top of the idol saying that you look after yourself and the priest had ran away. Khalid radiallahu anhu enters the temple. The minute he enters the temple, a black naked woman comes forward. Now I see everyone's attention is focused. A black naked woman comes forward. A scary looking woman, completely naked. Her figure was kind of disfigured. Khalid radiallahu anhu did not even flinch. He did not even think, is she a woman who has come to to seduce me or who is she? Nothing. She was in his way. He struck her one blow with the sword. Her head went rolling that time. Khalid ibn al-Walid went in, destroyed the idol, went back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed him, Ya Khalid, that was what I asked you about earlier. Because that was an evil jinn. An evil jinn who had taken the form of a lady and who had misled some of the people thinking that she was the idol or she was to be worshipped. So my dear brothers in Islam, he witnessed many battles afterwards. Basically Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu was such a warrior that since he embraced Islam, he never got down from his saddle. And it will not be exaggeration even if I were to say that. He never got down from his saddle. Whenever he used to come back from a battle, he had to go for another battle. He used to come back with his turban smeared with blood. Smeared with blood. His weaponry all smeared with blood. He comes, another battle was going on, he had to go for another battle. Allahu Akbar. His strength, my dear brothers in Islam, he could cut meat off a running horse. This was Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. You know how fast a horse gallops. He could match the speed of that horse whilst running and cut meat off that horse if he wished to. And in the battlefield, when Khalid radiallahu anhu used to give blows, when he used to blow, in the sense when he used to hit a person with his sword, the blow of his sword used to go right through the skull of that individual, right through the middle, and reach until the saddle of that soldier. Allahu Akbar. This was the strength of Khalid radiallahu anhu. And after the demise, after the passing away of our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, many ridda wars took place. In other words, many wars of apostasy took place. Because many individuals popped up claiming that they were prophets. Such as Musaylama, such as Taja, such as Aswad al-Anasi, such as Sulayha and individuals of that nature. And then there were people who refused to pay zakah. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the minute he came into Khilafah, the minute he became the Caliph, he deployed, he used Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu to destroy all of those evil forces. Every battle, my dear brothers in Islam, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu went for with the will of Allah, he was victorious. Battle of Ghamra, where he defeated Sulayha, a false prophet. Afterwards, Khalid radiallahu anhu marches to Naqra and defeated the rebel tribe of Banu Salim at the Battle of Naqra. The region afterwards was secured after the Battle of Zafar with the defeat of a tribal mistress known as Salma. Then another battle which was against another rebel tribe which was led by Malik ibn Nuwayra, all of which were decisive victories for Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. After that, Khalid radiallahu anhu crushed the most powerful threat to the Islamic state of Medina, Musaylama, the false prophet. He claimed prophethood, he was defeated by the Muslim army with Khalid radiallahu anhu at the helm at the battle of Yamama. All of these battles were decisive victories for the Muslim army, after which began the invasion of the Persian Empire. Battle after battle, my dear brothers in Islam, I will need, I don't know, perhaps a week or two to cover all of these battles of Khalid ibn al-Walid, each of which is filled with fascinating stories of his bravery, of his courage. The battle of the chains, 
the battle of the river, the battle of Walaja, the battle of Ulayis, the battle of Daumatul Jandal, the invasion of the Eastern Roman Empire, battle of Qaryatayn, battle of Ajnadayn, battle of Marj Rahid, battle of Yarmouk, which is an indeed a, which is indeed a fascinating battle, the battle of Yarmouk, which highlights the, 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 the tactical strategies of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an. All of these battles, battle after battle, was a victory for Khalid radiallahu an. My dear brothers in Islam, history has not witnessed and will not witness a soldier the likes of Khalid radiallahu an after our great Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear brothers in Islam, he was indeed a soldier. He was not worried of death. We saw the statement of the, the Byzantine priest. This was when Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu was charging ahead. He used to go with a small number against huge numbers. They used to be in the hundreds of thousands. He used to be in the thousands. But the victory was with the Muslim army. Allahu Akbar. This became so famous. In other words, so widespread that gradually a belief began to develop amongst the Muslims that... A, superst- a superstitious belief that if only if Khalid radiallahu an is in the army, then victory is sealed for the Muslim army. Now this, my dear brothers in Islam, happened during the Khilafah of Umar radiallahu an. The minute this news travelled to Umar radiallahu an, The value of proper aqidah, the value of tawheed was more important to Umar radiallahu an than conquest. He immediately writes that Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an should step down from his leadership. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, my dear brothers in Islam, a true soldier who was not fighting for fame and prosperity, who was fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, abides the command of Amir al-Mu'mineen and steps down. Many people brought up issues with Khalid, with Umar radiallahu anhu for that decision. But Umar radiallahu anhu had to take such a harsh, harsh decision so that the belief of the people, of the masses, would be put right. Because the very next battle that took place without Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu being at the helm was also a decisive victory for the Muslims. So the Muslims came back to their proper belief and all of those superstitions went flying out of the window. This was the reason why Khalid, why Umar radiallahu anhu deployed, in other words used this maneuver in removing Khalid radiallahu anhu from his seat of power. My dear brothers in Islam, now we move to the death of Khalid radiallahu an. 21 years after Hijrah, he is at the age of 58. Khalid radiallahu an takes ill. Now a few days before his demise, before his death, a friend of his comes to visit him and sits beside him. Khalid radiallahu anhu tells him, Oh my friend, he lifts his dressed up to his knee and tells him, please look at my leg and tell me, do you see even a span of a hand on my leg which is not covered by some scar or some wound of a sword or an arrow or a lance, basically a wound from the battlefield. The friend says, no, your leg, your leg is basically covered with wounds. The other leg, coward. He opens his hand, nothing. He exposes his chest. His whole chest is covered with wounds, scars of war. He turns and shows his back. Not even a span of a hand to say that his skin is free of the scars of battle. Allahu Akbar. And then Khalid radiallahu anhu, he asks his friend, Oh my friend. I have sought martyrdom in over a hundred battles. Allahu Akbar. So many battles. I can go on mentioning the names of battles after battles that Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu took part in. 
all of those battles, I was right in the front. I jumped into the thick of the battle. I wanted to be martyred. But why could I have not died in a battle, but rather I am lying on my bed at home? His friend explains to him, Ya Khalid, you could not have died in a battle. You could not have died in a battle. He asks, why not? He says, the minute Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam titled you as Sayfullah al-Maslul, the drawn sword of Allah, it will not befit you if a kafir kills you on the battlefield. It will be as if that kafir broke the sword of Allah. So it only befits you that you die at your home in your bed like a sword retiring from the battlefield. You are the sword of Allah and now Allah Himself is taking you back to Him. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. His friend leaves him. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu then realizes it is true. In other words, the explanation of his friend hit home. And then on the day of his death, my dear brothers in Islam, Khalid radiallahu anhu's belongings, his possession, Allahu Akbar, he lived in the lap of luxury. One of the princes, one of the princes of Quraysh, yeah, not princess, the, the plural of prince, of the Quraysh, yeah, he was one of them, one of the noblemen of Quraysh. And you know what his belongings were at the time of his death? Nothing other than his armor, his weapons, his horse, and one slave, Allahu Akbar. A real soldier, a commander, a warrior. This was Khalid radiallahu an. This was Khalid radiallahu an. Today our youngsters, we, the sons of Islam, they watch what? 300. Sparta, or the Spartans, and you are inspired by movies of that nature of the bravery that is portrayed in those movies. Read the history of Islam. Study about the Sahaba Ridwanullah Ta'ala alayhi majma'een. And you will see such great personalities that those movies, those personalities that they talk about are nothing in comparison to the likes of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu He now is on his deathbed. He says, I die just as how a camel dies. I die in bed, in shame. How can I die like this? The, the, the eyes of the cowards do not close even in sleep. Allah Akbar. And his friend also said, my dear brothers in Islam, that if a kafir were to kill Khalid radiallahu an, it would be that the sword of Allah was broken and also it would be a coolness to the kuffar that they had eventually killed Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an. But no. That was not the case. But rather, Allah the Almighty Himself claimed Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an through a natural death. And my dear brothers in Islam, thus died the son of al-Walid, Sayfullah al-Maslul, the drawn sword of Allah, Khalid ibn al-Walid, ibn al-Mughira, al-Makhdumi, al-Qurashi radiallahu an. May Allah the Almighty be pleased with him the minute he passed away. The news of his death, death travels all the way to Medina. The women, they took to the streets and they started crying. The women of Bani Makhzum, they started crying out for the warrior Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an. They were wailing and crying. Umar radiallahu an who hears this wailing and it was his command. The minute he came to Khilafah that if a person, if a believer passes away, none should wail, none should cry. Because at the end of the day, we are departing from this transitory stage to our eternal residence. What is there to wail and what is there to cry? The minute he heard this wailing and this crying, he came rushing out to see what was happening. He came out so angry. But then the minute he saw the scene that was happening in front of him, and when he heard that Khalid ibn al-Walid, Abu Sulaiman had passed away. He kept quiet for a few moments. Because this was not an ordinary death, my dear brothers in Islam. All of these great superpowers, all of these empires had come under the Muslim 
control under the Muslim empire through the will of Allah and Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. Through the will of Allah and Allah using Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. This was not an ordinary death. He keeps quiet. And then he hears even the moaning of his own daughter from his house, Hafsa, Hafsa radiallahu anhu, who was weeping for Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu turns back and he says, let the women of Banu Makhzum, let the women of Banu Makhzum say whatever they want to say about Abu Sulaiman, because they are not lying, he is indeed a warrior. And then he goes on to say, over the likes of Abu Sulaiman, weep those who weep. May Allah have mercy upon Abu Sulaiman, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. My dear brothers in Islam, with that we conclude very briefly, very br- briefly, about the story of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu because I skipped so many battles, so many incidents because of the lack of time. We need so many sessions to cover the whole life story of Khalid ibn al-Walid. But I hope with the help of Allah that I have instilled in your heart the desire to know more about him. The desire to know more about the Sahaba, Ridwan Allah Ta'ala, Alayhim Ajma'een, and these great personalities. We have the Prophet, Alayhim Salatu Wasalam, the Sahaba, Ridwan Allah Ta'ala, Alayhim Ajma'een, and then we have even the, the scholars and the other great personalities of this Ummah that you need to be reading about and knowing about, and taking them as your role models. For only then, my dear brothers in Islam, will all of us be successful in this world as well as the hereafter. So I hope I have instilled in your heart the desire to know more about Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. Read more about him. There are many books, there are many resources that you can delve into to know more about Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu because he was such a great warrior. It is indeed worthwhile for all of us to know complete details about him, about all of these battles, about the bravery of the Sahaba, of the Sahabiyyat, the women Sahaba, the women companions of our Master Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and other incidents. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, having said that, we conclude today's session. May Allah the Almighty forgive all of our sins. May He the Almighty accept all of our good deeds. And may He Azza wa Jal unite us in the gardens of Jannah with our Master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just as how He united us here this evening. Wa akhir da'waya anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah.